But we're going to have a, a real deep session this afternoon because using a little mini movie, a Star Trek mini movie, and some amazing ideas, we're going to go into the core of forgiveness. Because um, forgiveness is something that's been talked about for many, many centuries since the time of Jesus. Even in the Bible, it says, forgive seven times seventy. And that's, some of us have tried it, that's 490 times and it didn't work. <laughs> we still had to bring us back 490 times. So, we have to go for a qualitative shift in our mind, not a quantitative repetition of mantras and Hail Marys in the thousands and tens of thousands and millions of times. All we have to do is have a little tweak in our mind. One little tweak, in one instant, to have a life of happiness. And I thought I would just uh, read just a little bit from the beginning of Lesson 121 from A Course in Miracles. It's called, Forgiveness is the Key to Happiness. Here is the answer to your search for peace. Here is the key to meaning in a world that seems to make no sense. Here is the way to safety in apparent dangers that appear to threaten you at every turn and bring uncertainty to all your hopes of ever finding quietness and peace. Here are all questions answered. Here the end of all uncertainty ensured at last. So, this lesson I will be giving today is going to be going to the root and then going beyond the root into the experience. And so, I invite you all to really just come and join me today, because everyone is entitled to happiness. That's all everyone wants. It doesn't matter what they're doing or how they're acting, what their behavior is underneath, they're calling out for a life of happiness. And with the ego as the guide, it just has a search and never find it. You know, it made up a world where we would search and search and search, and it would seem to be very frustrating, but, but actually we want to go right at the root today. So, sometimes, you know, you'll be watching something, or thinking about something, or a behavior or something, and you'll just think, yeah, that's just really messed up. And so we have things in this world that seem to be beautiful, and wonderful, and harmonious, <coughs> and just, we feel so connected. And then there's other things which we say, that's just plain messed up. That's just not right. And I would say that when we talk about the Kingdom of Heaven, or Nirvana, or Oneness, that those are just words that are pointing us to a natural state of being, which just is who we are. We're just naturally peaceful, happy, and joyful in our creative state. Where, not only were we created, but we create. We're co-creators, we have the same abilities that God has to create beauty, love, spirit, joy, happiness. And that the reason that we're out of touch with that is because we've let a lot of duality and multiplicity and concepts come in the way. It's almost like filling a beautiful holy mind up with a bunch of things that don't really belong in that holy mind. And you can call it whatever you want. Uh, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, I think Socrates, some of you saw that movie, he was a teacher, he said, take the trash out. I mean, we take the trash out in our homes, right? Why don't we take the trash out of our minds? And, and maybe it seems like a lot, but it's worth starting. Um, if we're going to take the trash out, we might as well begin. So, the root of this whole thing is that when we say it's messed up, anything that comes from our source is holy, and anything that doesn't come from source, that still seems to be real, is an illusion that we're still holding on to, and we want still to be real. We would rather the illusion be true than the truth. So really, the, that's why Buddha, is Buddha sitting with us now, he just said, empty your mind of everything you think, everything you know. Come into the stillness, come into emptiness, come into the void. He, he offered a beautiful invitation for all of us. And 
the root of all the struggles and difficulties we have is, is time. Source did not create time. Time is an invention. And I think all of us, somewhere deep down inside, we have an inkling of the truth of that. Remember when you were a child and you were playing, and you were so happy you were playing, and you, you lost track of the hours, you lost track of the minutes, you had no awareness of time. We've all had those experiences when we were playing. Or think of it even as an adult, when you're doing something that you just love, and you completely lose track of time in that experience of that love. Think of it even as maybe meeting a friend for a walk on the beach, or going to have dinner with a friend that you haven't seen in a long time. How happy you are to see them. How you just, oh, you just want to hug them, and then you just get completely absorbed in that love, that experience of being there with them, and you lose track of time. So, we all are, are clued into this, that, that in order to go into that love, and experience that love in a continuous way, we have to now find a way to lose track of time. And conversely, when you think of anything that stresses you out, anything where you feel fear, guilt, stress, pressure, anxiety, it always involves time. Like I was sharing earlier, there's no problem sitting in traffic. I love LA traffic. I, I hope to get the experience. I come out here, I hope I can have some, I, I, the lights lighting up, and, and crank the music up, and you know, it's just the most glorious experience. And so, but it's, it has to do with, because it's like a timeless experience for me. I just, I, when I first came out, and I first was, there was like seven lanes, and all the red lights came on, I was just, oh, pretty, pretty, pretty. <laughs> so pretty. All the pretty red lights, you know. And so the streamers, too, just stream on and on and on, you know. But the thing about it is, is all guilt comes from the belief in time. And all of these concepts, like, for example, we take on all these roles in the course of a human lifetime. We take on roles. We pick them up, we play them for a while, we set them down. But if you follow them down, all of these roles have roots in linear time. That, that the Spirit, even the Bible says, God is no respecter of persons, but I would say probably the most profound line uh, in the Bible for me was when Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. That actually the present moment and eternity exists prior to time, and the problem is, we've got it all messed up. We think the present is between the past and the future. It's not. We've been struggling with all these practices and mantras and spiritual practices over and over and over. We don't seem to realize yet that time is the problem. Linear time is the problem. That time and eternity can't coexist. Time is very incremental. It's broken up into pieces. And once we focus our mind on those pieces, we're lost. We may glide, like the, the Simon and Garfunkel song, believe we're gliding down the highway, when in fact we're slip sliding away. You know, very profound. We really think we can be happy in linear time, and I'm telling you right now, it ain't ever going to happen. All the perennial wisdoms talk about the present moment. Everything associates present with presence. Mm -hmm. And we've had plenty of witnesses tell us about that, and now it's time for us to really go for it. So, we're out here, we're out here in California, LA, you know, you guys are groundbreakers. You know, you guys are cutting edge, you know. You guys have been doing it for years, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It's time we, we take the lead here and, and Take it on, lead the way for the rest of, of the, the universe, because the universe is us, and we are the universe. You know, everything we do for ourselves, we're doing for the whole planet, for the whole solar system, for the whole galaxy, for the whole cosmos. So, let's be clear on that right away, that, that God didn't create time. That eternity doesn't have time as a component of it. Even the great mystics, some of you have heard of Joel Goldsmith. 
he, he talked about this whole experience as a parenthesis in eternity. So we're wanting to remove the parentheses and come back to eternity. We are eternal beings. We have no beginning and no end. That's why in the end you can laugh at death, because death is, is a belief that our Creator did not create. Our Creator is life, is the source of life, and who we are is life, and will be everlasting life. But this life does not begin at birth, and it does not end at death. In some cultures they actually mourn birth, <laughs> and celebrate death. Wow. So you know, if there's cultures in this world that do that, then we can't say that there's any truth to the idea that anything really begins at birth and ends at death. Some people talk about an afterlife. Well, again, life is prior to time, so, so life doesn't have anything to do with the past or what we call traditionally the present or the future. Let me take a moment to explain that. Everyone has a conception of the past, but when we think of the present, there's a, a conversational term called present, like, for example, we are all present in this room right now, but that's not the present. These images that you see around you are not the present, nor do they have anything to do with the present moment. This construct of we are here in the room present, is made up by the ego as well. It's part of a trick. So the ego invented the past and the present in its own version, just like it invented its own version of love, which is superficial and it's empty, and when you go to it and you, go, you see it's a fantasy, it's not what it seems to be at all, it's just another trick. And the future. So basically what I'm saying is the past the present, as the ego invented it, and the future are all part of the trick. That's why it doesn't matter how many times you say the word, help me be present, help me be present, it's not going to be the words, and it's not going to be focusing on anything of time and space, including breathing, that's, that's a helpful step along the way, because you start to train your mind to concentrate. But you won't be able to focus on anything of time to make it back into the experience of eternity. Now, in perfect oneness, it's just the perfect state of absolute beingness. It's just perfect, perfect love. And there aren't any skills, and there aren't any abilities, it's just total communion with Source. It's just an eternal, you could say like an eternal song that just goes on and on and on forever, without beginning or end. So, one of the, one of the abilities that was made up in the seeming fall from grace, or the forgetting of that oneness, is memory. So I'm going to talk a little bit about memory, because our movie today is going to give us the key back to, the, to eternity, through showing us a different way of using memory. Memory is an, is an ability that the ego made up. There is no memory in heaven, because there's, memory is like recall. And there's nothing to recall in perfect oneness. Everything just is love. So even though the ego made memory, the ego uses the memory to perpetuate guilt. It wants to keep you guilty. It wants to use memory, which it made, in a way that will perpetuate guilt, because if it perpetuates guilt, it will pe perpetuate the ego itself. And the ego does want to exist, even though it's a puff of nothingness and it wasn't created, it wants to exist. So if we keep misusing memory, we are playing into the hands of the ego, and any time you have a grievance against anything in this world, be it a person, be it against the weather, climate, I mean against a politician, against anything, that is the misuse of memory. That is the use of memory to try to keep hurt and conflict in awareness. And so, we want to realize that we, it's about time we stop misusing memory. Now, memory may be something that you've always associated with just the past, but I will tell you something. You can actually use memory 
in conjunction with your spirit to remember the present. Because the spirit can use anything that the imposter made, including memory. So that's why any type of spiritual discipline that starts to, whether it's breathing, Tai Chi, movement, dance, song, like we were just doing, that was a beautiful, inspired use of memory. Because we knew that song, and we were inspired, and you could feel the vibe and the love and the energy start to flow. You know, when Crystal was singing, it was just, you could feel how strong it was. That is now going to be our spiritual practice. We're going to use memory in a helpful way. Now, another thing with memory is, we have to use it in a focused way, to just focus it completely upon the present, because if you focus it in the future, that's what we call ambition and goals and most, a lot of us were raised in this world to have ambitions, you know, to make something of your life. Mm -hmm. And actually the state of presence is, has no ambition in it. Um, I remember the very first time I was sitting there watching the, the very long movie Gandhi, and he was walking with this American journalist along named Walker, and and uh, I think they were in South Africa. I w actually went to South Africa, and I happened to be at the same place where they had the ashram down there. And they were walking along, and the reporter, the American reporter, said to Gandhi, looking at the big ashram they were building, he said, Mr. Gandhi, you're quite an ambitious fellow. And Gandhi's answer was, I hope not. <laughs> and something in my heart, I don't know how old I was, but something just leaped when I heard that answer. Because I was raised in a Protestant family, Protestant work ethic, a lot of us work hard, achieve your dreams, shoot for something in the future. Mm. It's the ego, it's tricking, it's trying to trick us into being successful in artificial concepts that have nothing to do with our Creator and nothing to do with our Source. It's very sneaky. And it's so reflected in the culture that if you seem to be very successful and earn a lot of money and have a lot of possessions and, and all kinds of things connected to the body, there's a lot of reflections of very good. You've done very well. Even from parents, you turned out well. I'm glad to see that one of mine turned out well. Mm. It's a big trick. It's all a deception. And this little mini-movie is going to show you that very explicitly. Because in this mini-movie, called Time's End, it's going to invite us into a new use of memory. For example, most of us are used about thinking about good memories and bad memories. Common. Common thing. Good memories and bad memories. Who makes that distinction? It's the ego. And the ego has invented its own feel-good memories, and its own bad memories, and is trying to convince us that the feel-good memories feel better than the bad memories, so we should just maximize the feel-good memories, and minimize and eliminate all the feel-bad memories. And the problem is, they're all the same, because they came from the same maker. Pleasure and pain, for example, do they seem the same to you? No, not usually. <laughs> they seem very different, but they both are generated by the imposter. And that's what I mean by artificial goodness. Because if this world was nothing but pain, everything was entirely painful, you would drop it like a hot potato and be back in Nirvana before you could say Nirvana. <laughs> It'd be really quick. But because the ego disguises itself, into things that seem temptingly good, and yet when you reach out and you go for it, it's fool's gold. Yeah. You still feel that emptiness. And then you go, hmm, that wasn't it. Yeah. And then the ego goes, keep trying. And so it keeps shifting the kaleidoscope around, making the diamond glimmer and shine from different turns and different angles, so that you'll keep pursuing the diamond. Kind of like the Titanic, the, the heart of the ocean is all about this diamond. At the end, she, the, the lady still has the diamond, the heart of the ocean. She goes, whoops! She drops it <laughs> into the ocean. 
Uh, my heart leaped when I saw that diamond going down into the ocean. You know? <laughs> because, you know, a diamond is so precious in the world's eyes. You know, it's worth so much money. A big diamond like that. Huge amount of money. And she just, whoops. She cared more about the love, remembering the love affair, than she did about the rock. More about the love, less about the rock. And, and that was a big moment. Well, this movie is going to, it's actually going to show us an enactment of, of, of what seems to be perceived as a grievance. Some of you have, have, are Star Trek fans, Trekkies. Um, this is going to be Captain Sisko in this one. And Captain Picard is in it as well. And the scene we'll open up with um, is that Captain Picard, you know, in his ship, he was taken in by the Borg. Anybody remember the Borg? They're the ones that assimilate yes. individual consciousness into a collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. I would say it's more like a collective unconsciousness, because <laughs> they, you know, they're still into power and control and everything like this. It's more like the collective unconsciousness than the collective consciousness. So they assimilate him, and then Cisco is also part of the Federation. His ship gets fired upon by um, the Borg who have taken Captain Picard, and Sisko's wife will be killed in the attack. So, this is a good forgiveness lesson. The death of a wife, the death of a spouse. I don't know if anybody in here has experienced that, but I will say there is beliefs underneath that grief. Belief in loss. And the sadness of, of broken communication not being able to hold somebody, to touch their face, to caress them. All the things that were so heavily associated with the love are gone. And so, he has a lot of anger. And this little mini-movie is going to take us past Cisco's anger and into... A, we're going to go through a wormhole and come face to face with the light. No, not the Klingons, the Romulans, <laughs> the Borg, all the different... We're not going to different parts of the cosmos, we're actually going to pierce through the veil of the cosmos and come directly into contact with the light. So, some of you have had that experience, perhaps, in meditation, when you, or, or just in a moment when you had a revelatory experience, where you had a direct experience of that love and that light. Some maybe have not, and I would say the, the interesting thing with the human race is that most of the human race has so pushed the light out of awareness, has so denied that light and love, that, that all it has is comparisons and contrasts of circumstances and events in time and space. Mm. You know, we throw the words around love and I love you, but a lot of times the love is just associated with romantic love, or the love of a child, or the love of a pet, or the love of a, of a geographical area, the ocean, the scenery. But it's not that kind of direct connection with, with divinity, which is what we are and what we came from. So this will give us a bit of a chance to go toward that, because we're going to go beyond perception into a contact with the light. And the interesting thing about the light, it's very much what Jesus talked about and Buddha talked about, because the light has no opinions, um, the light is just pure love, and there isn't uh, a mix with the, the concepts of this world. The light doesn't know of competition, because what does competition require? Two. two. And love, oneness, only knows itself, so it doesn't know two. It doesn't know of competition. It doesn't know of human relationship in the sense that we're back on the timeline. Uh, the main character, he's going through all this grief because he is sure that there are good memories when his wife was alive. And he shared all these loving memories with his wife. And when his wife is killed, he just feels like it's gone forever. He'll never be able to have that back again. So he has this huge grief this huge anger and this huge projection of the anger of what was what happened to his wife. And he's going to start off this, this mini-movie with a major grievance. And he's going to go through a whole transformation. 
with the light, in which he sees memory, what we were talking about, from a whole new perspective. He sees that it was only his judgments that certain situations were bad memories, and certain situations were good memories, that that choosing, that discerning between the good and the bad, was the very thing that was holding the anger, holding the hurt. And that he can let go of his whole use of memory in order to go through a reborn, a healing experience. And what's fascinating about this too is, Cisco will be given an assignment to, to go down to this planet, the Bajoran, and he thinks he's going down to help these kind of uncivilized people. Because he's like, because they don't have warp drive, and they don't have the technological advances, so he's, he's going to look upon this planet and these people, very much like people in Australia look upon the Aborigines. You know, the Aborigines are very telepathic, and amazingly connected. <laughs> They're perceived by Western civilization as the primitive ones. That's what's going to happen here. He's going to go to this planet, and he thinks he's there to help them out. And actually, they're spiritually advanced. And so, they're going to be a part of his healing. There's going to be a thing called the Tear of the Prophet that literally is going to use his memories to start to take him out of his sadness and anger and show him there's a much greater perspective that he just has his blinders on. So, it's the same, the same thing we face in this civilized world where, where we have lots of, of governments, and technology, and so on and so forth, and then these primitive tribes that are so devotional, <laughs> and that are telepathic, are seen as the, the primitive, less advanced ones. It's all flipped. It's all backwards in this world. And we're going to see that in here, that he has to be humbled by working with these, these people, this uh, prophet that he's going to work with, who knows far more than, than him spiritually, and yet, he thinks he's going to be the emissary, and going to be the, the hero, and save the day for them. And she's kind of like, using her telepathic powers to say, ironic. <laughs> the one that is here, you know, to be the emissary, to be, to help us, is the one that's in need of the most <laughs> healing. Is the one that doesn't even want to be here, and yet needs to be there more than anything. So, I will pause it a little bit, but, this is going to be a great adventure, because it's going to give us a touch of that oneness that's beyond all comparisons. And I think most of you can, can realize that the complexities of this world, if you really trace them down, it's because we're trying to choose, we're trying to make choices in this world that will bring us happiness. And. Uh, We've got seven billion people on the planet, each doing the best that they can, every day, based on what they believe, to find happiness. And most are not out of the seven billion. They would say they have a very emotional roller coaster ride of emotions. They're not reporting bliss and nirvana <laughs> on the search. <laughs> you know, oh, I went out to Malibu Beach, I did this, 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 and this. How do you feel? I'm a little tired. <laughs> you know, you know, we, we're, we go on vacations, we come back, we, we're supposed to be pretty rested. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes not, you know. This, it, you don't really get bliss uh, from planet Earth. But, I would just say, it's just from the misuse of memory. And we all have that power to, to turn our memory around. We took a trip with Alexander to walk out on the pier, and we were out in the sunshine, and we went and got ice cream, and you know, and I would say we had such a fun day because we were just grabbed in the flow. We were like twigs in the river. Just no thing, nothing in particular, just enjoying each other's vibe, going down there, walking out on the pier, just having a wonderful day. Three of us, like he's in, Alexander and I, and it's because we didn't have any agendas, Nothing that we had to do, nothing that we had to see, nowhere we had to go. He was driving, and we were happily, you want to get out? No, we love it in here with you. We want to stay in here. And then, we finally, then we finally did get out and go in the sunshine, splashed around in the sunshine. But you see, 
That's a good use of memory. That's, that's using memory for the flow. And all of our programming is saying, well, no, you have memory for, for really good reasons. It's called the gross national product. That's <laughs> gross. <laughs> and it's gross. You know, you think of it, you think of putting all that mind energy and that use of memory into achieving outcomes, when the whole point is to let go of all outcomes and be. We're just here to be. They already did it. And, you know, some of us had little bits and touches of the hippie generation that I think, yeah, you know, I, that's why I love to come to California all the time. I'm like, oh, I'm like out here, I'm like, yeah. Maybe I don't have the beads and things that I had had before. But I still, you know, I still, when I'm inside, I'm a hippie. Uh, and so we just want to, we want to bring that alive again. We're not, we're not trying to bring the 60s back, we're trying to bring eternity back into our awareness. It's much bigger than the 60s. <laughs> That's a nice reflection though. But we, we know that we want to have that joy, that happiness, and that love, that eternal feeling. No cares, no worries. So, whatever the roles are that we seem to play in this world, we, we don't want to get too hung up in the role, because then we lose sight of the purpose. When I go to a, like a, a restaurant and I'm there and I, I'm sitting down to order and I see a waitress come in, I, one time it was like her first day and I could see she was, she was kind of shaky and she was really nervous and everything and so she was going around taking orders, she was so scared and then she came to me, I just took time to just say, listen, I said, you bring the food, you don't bring it, it's okay with me. You drop the food, you dump it all over my lap, I'm still going to give you the biggest tip. <laughs> and then she just, she just relaxed. And then instantly, after I said that, I watched her just relax and start to glide around like she'd been there for 20 years. She just, it just takes the moment. These, everything we perceive is a reflection of our thoughts. And so if we have that gentle spaciousness, that ease, that relaxation, that everything's great, everything's wonderful feeling, then the world reflects that back to us. And we all know that's how it works when we're having one of those great days. Yeah. Everything reflects it back to us. Absolutely everything. We just have to remember that's how powerful we are. And that's the good use of memory. So here we go. We're going to see this. If the first scenes are going to be um, scenes of the Borg having taken um, the captain, Captain Picard over, and he's going to make his commands and threaten Cisco's trip ship. He's going to fire upon it, and we're going to see this kind of destructive scene at the beginning. And then we're going to shift ahead to some years in the future where Cisco still is carrying the grievance of his wife being killed. It's like something precious has been taken from him, and he's still very, very angry, and he's going to meet with Picard, who's been released from the board. But it's just like when you see an old friend, if you still have a grievance against somebody, and you meet for lunch, you know how it goes. Yeah. You're, you're kind of sitting there like, hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's something underneath, there's some kind of an agenda running in there, and you're not going to really enjoy your lunch if you've got some kind of a grievance from the past. And that's what Cisco has with Picard, but then the movie is going to show us a way to use memory in a new way to release the, that grievance forever. So whatever grievance you still believe you have against anyone or anything, this movie can be a huge inroad today to free your mind. It's not, you're not helping them, you're actually freeing your own mind when you release that grievance, and then you're, you free them and you free everyone. Okay, here we go. So, there we go. We, we saw the scene, we saw the attack, we saw the explosion, his wife Jennifer died, and you saw the look on his face. Just the the loss, the disillusionment of losing a life partner. Of, he rescued his son Jake, but he, he lost, and he just was looking out, and it was just a, a, a look of despair and loss. 
Now, again, from what I'm going to talk to you about and what we're going to retrain our minds, hopefully next time I come out we're going to have some centers going out here about time and memory reorientation. You guys can make a career out of healing out of this, um, because it's what everybody needs. So, you know, this is getting down to the roots of it. It's not balancing the energy in the body or anything to do with the body. It's Time is messed up, <laughs> and, and we need to use a different memory. We have to focus our memory another way. Now, that despair that you saw, and the, the sadness, and the loss, and the, and the feelings of loneliness, and abandonment, all those things, those all come from focusing our memory ability on attack. You can never focus your memory on innocence, and end up with despair. If you used memory for innocence, you would feel joy, happiness, peace. Really, you would feel your natural state of being if you were focusing the memories on, on that intent. But as long as there's a belief in attack, and you keep focusing the memory on that attack, then there's going to be a grievance. And it won't matter even if you're like the princess of the pea, if you seem to be well defended against that attack thought. You know, the princess in the pea, she was still sensitive enough to feel the pea underneath all the mattresses mm. in the fairy tale. We want to become that sensitized because we don't want to cover over something that's not real. We want to see the unreality, we want to see, the, see it exposed, we want to see it in the light of day. We don't want to just have to keep defending against and building more defenses against this shaky attack belief. Mm -hmm. And that's what this whole cosmos is about, is the belief that, that we could attack spirit or attack God. And now we're more attached to linear time than we are desiring of eternity. It's like we've, we bought the bait, seemingly, and now it's time to refocus our memory on the innocence. You know, in the Catholic Church for years, you know, they kept talking about original sin. Some of you have heard about that in Catholicism. How about original innocence? Let's say hey for original innocence, right? Let's, let's just shift the focus a little bit, like away from the, the, the guilt and the shame and the pain and the hurt and the sin, let's focus on the innocence. Well, that's what is going to happen with our character here, because we're going to go a few years in the future and he's going to get a chance to meet with Picard, Captain Picard. But you can just look, watch, watch it in his face, you see how, how tense his neck is. How he's just got this anger that's just under the surface, it's just coming out of his face. Because he's perceiving in Picard as the man who killed his wife. He's still focusing on the guilt, on the attack, and he hasn't let go of that. And it's really for all of us. He's, He's, this is all being acted out for all of us. Because, I'll tell you what, if, if you're out and, and you seem to get a mosquito bite that annoys you a little bit, like a little mosquito bite of irritation, there is rage underneath that mosquito bite. Absolute rage. The ego has just diluted the rage over a millennium. It's spread it out so much over time that you don't always experience that rage. You, you experience the annoyance, the irritation of a mosquito bite. But there is absolute rage underneath that mosquito bite. If you follow that little irritation all the way down into your mind, your powerful mind, you would find there's rage down there. And that rage is based on attack. And that attack is being held in mind by the use of memory. It, it, we don't have to keep doing that anymore. We can, we can shift. So here we go. It's going to give us a little parable here. No. But we could pause it there. So again, you see Captain Picard is, he got released from the Borg, he's, he's on with his mission. And he's actually wanting to send uh, Cisco down to the Bajorans to help them out. Nice. He's a proponent of them, he would like to see them helped, and so he's sending him on, on a, a mission of love. But, and, and his mind isn't that focused. You can see he was a little bit, kind of like, what's, what's yeah. going on here, you know? 
because there's a, a disproportionate amount of anger, it seems, yeah. there. But you see, it's like the Course teaches us, we're never upset for the reason we think. Also, it's not anything that's in the world that ever upsets us, it's our misperception. It's holding on to this guilt and this grievance in our own mind that we project it out and think, interpret that other people have wronged us. In this case, um, for Cisco, it's like a major violation. It's like, you, it's like he had the look of, you killed my wife. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to follow the orders because you are my commanding officer. But even in saying, I will do the best of my ability, you can see <laughs> there's like daggers coming out. Rage. Rage is coming out. And it's all based on a perception of being harmed by something in the world. Now what I'm going to say, the ego set up this whole thing. The ego set up time and space so that we would forever feel guilty. It's part of a, a trick that we try to project the guilt outside of our mind onto the characters and onto the images of the world. And the ego says, good, good, get it out. Yeah, good, get it off your chest. Scream it, yell. Eat some bataka sticks, go scream at somebody, tell them off, blast them. And the ego is telling us that that's how we're going to get rid of this feeling of hurt and anger. That's actually how we keep it. We actually keep it by trying to project it. You know, play the blame game. I remember one time, the Holy Spirit was kind of fun. I said, yeah, he said, yeah, whenever you point the finger, David, at anyone, there's three fingers back, pointing back at you. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's like the Holy Spirit's like saying, yeah, the, the Trinity is coming right back at you saying, pull it in here, don't push it out there, pull it in and forgive it. Because you're just going to keep it if you keep fault finding, projecting. And, and so he's not saying much there, but we can tell from his face and his tone of voice that he is furious. And the only reason he's furious is because it's a misinterpretation. He still doesn't see that he's using memory in the egoic way. He's still trying to use memory to maintain the attack. The attack is still going on in his mind, and he's still trying to scapegoat it. Some of you might remember that term, scapegoat. Um, I like how we got that term from the Bible, back in the, the Jewish tribes in the early days. What happened, what they would try to do is, they had a ritual where when, when the whole tribe, the whole village needed to be cleansed and purified of all of its wrongdoings and sins, they would get a goat. And they would bring a goat into the village. And then they would put, the high priest would place all the sins symbolically of the whole village on the head of a goat. And then they would chase the goat out of the village. They go, whew, made it through another year. <laughs> Let's do this again next year. Because they had accumulated so many seeming sins. And so that was that's where we get the term scapegoat. Scapegoat is to they're projecting it onto the head of this goat and then project, pushing it out of the village. So this is what's happening in a mind sense. We're trying to get rid of guilt and hurt and anger by seeing it as if it's out there in somebody else. So now we're going to see, he's come down to visit the Bajorans, and like I said, now it gets fun because he thinks he's going them to help them to be like their savior, and they're highly advanced spiritually. Oh, yeah. So the priestess is going to receive him very graciously, but right away she's going to have to be kind of firm with him, <laughs> because he's like the big captain, you know, and, and she's like, you know, that's not why you're really here. I'm going to help you get in touch with why you really come right here. There's a positive there. Yeah. The mind is so deep, and the capacities for repression and denial are so strong, and this amnesia thing, that when, his, when he perceived his wife was killed, he was so hurt. And we, a lot of us know how that works, when you feel really hurt, you start to like distance yourself from things. But sometimes to even think of the person and the memories, it can be too hard to like relive the memories because there's a sense of loss, like, well, that's gone forever. Like, thank you God for that. 
And, <laughs> and uh, that was a pretty good year and a pretty good lifetime I had going there. And then, you know, you take away my wife. So there's this, there's a lot of fury in the mind. And, and in this sense, he comes there, she says, the prophet is, you know, Kaipaka says, look for solutions from within. She introduces him to the tear of the prophet, and the tear of the prophet just gives him a glimpse of back at the time when he was so happy, so very happy on that beach. And yet the contrast between that happiness and the way that he feels now, which is shut down and, and angry, there's such a huge gulf there that you can see it's almost like his eyes are squinting, like it was such a beautiful light memory, and then he's back. And he had to face this huge contrast of, of emotion. So, the Holy Spirit has to work with contrast, and if you were asleep and dreaming, and you'd completely forgotten the light of heaven, and you even pushed out of awareness to, to fall from grace, and now you're just kind of gliding down the highway, slip sliding away as a human being, just trying to make your way through every day the best you can, and just counting your blessings and trying to get as, as helpful of a day and purposeful of a day as possible, then the Spirit has to use contrast because there's a lot of repressed unconscious darkness. We know, we can see the rage that he's got underneath him. <coughs> the Spirit has to find a way to let that rage up for healing. Because it's not going to heal if it keeps being pushed down out of awareness, if it's mm. not brought to the light. So this is the process of healing, and, and this has begun for him now, so he's, she's going to give him the gift of the tear of the prophet, like, take this with you. The thing that opened up his heart to that memory of love, but also he's going to need to go much further if he's going to let go of that rage. And it's the same for all of us, yeah. you know. <coughs> At some point you just say, okay God, bring it on, spirit. I would rather go through it and use this seeming lifetime to heal for all eternity and come home all the way back to God than to just dilly-dally and try to make the best of things, you know. Oh, they say, oh, just make the best of it, and oh, you got to take the good with the bad, and all the cliches of the world. Hmm, we're worth more than that. We're worth, we're worth eternity is what we're worth. We're worth divine love. And so the rest of this mini-movie is going to be the Spirit, in amazing, miraculous ways, using experiences to show him a new use of memory, so he can actually free his mind from the deep guilt. Okay, here's the first major lesson for all of us, that, that perception is is unreliable and completely variable. Like we may look, we may say the sky is blue, the ocean is blue, the clouds are wispy white, the grass is green, the trees are green. You know, it's we become so accustomed to fragmentation and separation and illusion. Now, when the mind's asleep, it actually thinks that its feet are standing on solid ground and it's in a real world, and we don't realize that this is a perceptual nightmare. Like dreams that you have when, when your mind's all stirred up with a nightmare. We've become, we've adapted and adjusted so much to the hallucination that we now seem to have somewhat stabilized in our perceptions, except we do learn through relationships that no two people see the same world. It seems now, instead of being one unified mind, one unified spirit, that we there's each body has its own little perception apparatus, five senses, its own view of the world. And there's not total agreement, even among soulmates. I always like the soulmates, where the you know, soulmates find each other, and they're together for like three years, and then they wake up in bed one morning. You believe, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's going to come up, because no two people see the same world. It's so variable. Now here, he's, he's just traveled in, and they've just landed in what seems to be a wormhole, he, you know, he doesn't, on what? What have we landed? He's the first one out the door, and we'll first see the light show us his perception, and then we'll see the light show us her perception. And you'll see why relationships are so difficult. 
because you've got two different perceptions trying to relate with each other that don't agree, that don't have a universal agreement. We may have common elements, but that makes it even sneakier to think that there's a reality there, when actually we're all just, it's just one mind perceiving, but it seems to have fragmented into seven billion different minds. But here's our first step. Before we go into the light, before we go to forgiveness, this is our first lesson. Here we go now. This is the first time they've ever gone to Star Trek beyond the veil. So this is not a new species. This is not an angel. The probe gave him a glimpse of the beach with his wife. Now the probe is going to open up a crack in the whole veil of time and space that has blinded humankind and everyone inside the veil from knowing the light. And this is what we need. This is why you hear of mystics and saints and, and you have revelatory experiences. I had three different revelatory experiences where I, I went so deep in meditation and so down past the fear that I went into the great rays and I went into pure revelation where I had the actual experience of this light. It wasn't any kind of earthly light, but it was like they talk about in near-death experiences where everything is one and words can't describe it. It was that kind of a thing. It just, the figure ground broke and then I just went totally into it. And so ever since I, I went into that and came back from that, it was very convincing, let me tell you. <laughs> the light is extremely convincing because it's nothing like perception at all. So he's, they're going to, this light's going to kind of come and it's going to like crack through perception. And then what's going to happen is the light is just pure abstract love. So it doesn't have any concepts, it doesn't even have words. It doesn't even have, there's no verbal content to it. It's purely telepathic love and oneness. So it's going to probe his mind and start to take the characters that he believes in and the words that he knows and now it's going to have to use those characters and words to reach him in a language that he can understand. And that's how the Spirit reaches us in this world. It, it has to use what we believe in. So it uses our likes, it uses our dislikes, our preferences. Um, like with the Course in Miracles, the scribe of the Course in Miracles, she was a big Shakespeare lover. And so, Jesus started dictating the Course, and at one point he just, he just shifted it gears, he shifted it into iambic pentameter. And he did chapter after chapter, line after line, verse after verse, in iambic pentameter for Helen, because she liked Shakespeare. And I've even seen musicians that are poets and everything, they'll be going, man, you know how hard it is to do like a paragraph of that iambic pentameter, to do chapter after chapter. Jesus was like, I love you so much, and she liked Shakespeare, so he gave her iambic pentameter, Shakespearean blank verse, and lots of it, page after page, chapter after chapter. Also, she was a research psychologist, so he used, he used psychology terms, he used educational terms, and he used terms from the Bible. It's almost like he thought, hmm, might as well correct this distortion of the Bible while I'm at it. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a good scribe here, so I'm going to reinterpret things like the Last Judgment, which is upside down, punishment, punishment, penance, crazy ideas that the ego inserted into Christianity, and Jesus just decided he's going to reinterpret the whole thing back to right side up instead of upside down. So this is beautiful because the light just probes, and now we're going to see the light communicate, not only with Cisco, but really it's communicating with all of us, because it's going to use the words and the symbols that we can understand. But it's just pure abstraction, it's pure love, pure oneness. Okay, how's it there? Look at the difference. On the right side, the face of anguish, mm. of seeing something that seems to be gone and lost and will never be experienced in that way again. Mm. You see the face of loss and you see 
the light is using her character mm. and she's just going, mm. what is this? You know, there's no associations mm. put. It's just pristine, it's just innocent. Mm. It doesn't have positive connotations or negative, it's just purely pure love. But it doesn't, love doesn't meet with linear perception, it doesn't meet with linear time. That's why when we when we build churches and synagogues, and we do rituals, and we try and try to pull mm -hmm. the light into this world, and we think that by doing all these rituals and this and that, it may help us somewhat to remember as a step, but, but what we really need to do is we need to bring all of our concepts, including linear time, back to the light and mm -hmm. give them over to the light and say, here, this is my present, this is what I made, I'm bringing it back to what is light, real and truth, and, and illusions will disappear when they're brought voluntarily and willingly to truth. But if we hold on them with ego defense mechanisms, mm -hmm. if we defend them, if we protect them, mm -hmm. if we want to be adamantly right instead of being happy, if we want to be, have intelligence, worldly intelligence more than wisdom, if we want to have freedom of the body more than freedom of the soul, freedom of the mind. You see, there's, we have this choice to make of whether we want to open up to the way we were created by God, which is pure spirit, or do we want to keep holding on to these concepts that are all false idols. You know, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. Hold no idols before the Lord thy God. That was from the Bible. Now we're starting to see, oh, it's not just talking about golden calves. It's not talking about totem poles. It's talking about our identity and these images that we've made up, the ego has made up as our identity. So, so really this is about bringing truth to the <coughs> illusion. And it's, I just want to read one more little passage from the, the Course. So this is from Lesson 22, because He's getting ready to go into a major forgiveness lesson. This is what Jesus said, says to us, What could you want? Forgiveness cannot give. Do you want peace? Forgiveness offers it. Do you want happiness? A quiet mind, a certainty of purpose, and a sense of worth and beauty that transcends the world? Do you want care and safety and the warmth of sure protection always? Do you want a quietness that cannot be disturbed, a gentleness that can never be hurt, a deep abiding comfort and a rest so perfect it can never be upset? All this forgiveness offers you and more. It sparkles on your eyes as you awake, and gives you joy with which to meet the day. It soothes your forehead while you sleep, and rests upon your eyelids, so you see no dreams of fear and evil, malice and attack. And when you wake again, it offers you another day of happiness and peace. All this forgiveness offers you. And more. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's why we're doing this. He's he's using all of his words and error, mm, and and he's saying and more. Like you have no idea. This is going to blow your socks off. If this is going to give you a joy like you have never ever experienced, take your most joyful moment, memory in this. Lifetime and just magnify, multiply by ten, and then another ten, and another hundred, and you're still not there. You know, this is really worth everything. It's worth putting your attention. That's why we do mind training. That's why we do forgiveness, and that's why we're watching this mini movie, just to help get a remembrance of the glimpse of how important this really is in all of our priorities. You know, to to come back to this. So he's he's going through. A forgiveness lesson here where he's bringing all of his ideas to the light. He's actually trying to describe and explain <coughs> a linear existence and the light just doesn't relate. 
Uh, and the light will never relate uh, to it, because oneness, pure oneness, doesn't take on a disguise. It's, it's, it wants to be openly revealed. It's not like God is trying to hide something or hold it back. It's just like the ego has been the one that's doing the hiding. Well, it tries so hard to explain why its attitude is justified. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. Oh, he's just beginning. He's he's going to try to explain baseball to the light. He's going to he's going to try to to let the light in. Like, oh, we do have some really nice things, and and you'll see what the light's response is to all of his uh, things. You know, he's going to try. He's going to really try. Okay, here we go. So that's the motive to coexist and learn. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> darkness and light don't coexist. You bring the darkness to the light and the darkness disappears. Even in this world there's a parallel. When we talk about ignorance, what happens when ignorance comes upon wisdom? It disappears. It disappears and all that remains is wisdom. Mm -hmm. So to explore, he likes to explore. Well, you know, that's part of the whole Star Trek thing, to explore where no man has gone and everything. Ha! Too bad they pop through to the light. Mm. And now, the exploration can stop. In the sense that, what he's so excited about with baseball, is this idea of hypotheticals. You don't know what's going to happen. Why would people pay money to go to a Dodgers game if they knew what the outcome was? Why do people go on a first date? Isn't there something exciting about a first date? Yeah, yeah. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether you'll say, okay, can I remember, can I call you, da 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 da, da. or, well, it's kind of it's been nice, but yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you for a fine meal. <laughs> yeah, right. You see, it's the anticipation, it's the hypotheticals, that the ego is using to keep the mind from discovering its true identity. It's generating false excitement. Has anybody ever gone to a casino? Imagine if you knew your entire visit to the casino. The top tables, the cards, you already knew if you would win or lose. You think people would go? and throw down money if they already knew they were going to lose. You see? That's, that's where it's playing it out. And so, that's the thing where, whether it's with dating, whether it's with um, baseball or sports, whether it's with politics, you know, there's, there's some political candidates that are starting to get geared up here for primaries and this and this, the whole political system what drives, what's the energy that's behind that? We talked about that earlier, about maybe you want to bring love and peace and joy, but I was saying you can do it through your mind, through your purpose. Not through trying to affect a change. Projecting out a government as if they're the ones governing. Who governs your mind? Are you, are you going to govern your mind? Or are you going to play little, play small, and put politicians out there and watch them do their antics and, and play the judgment game. Mm, I like this one. Oh, I don't like this one. I'm going to vote for this one, but I'm not going to vote for that one. And then election night. What's happen? Who's going to make it? Come on, burn, burn, burn. Come on, go, go, go. You know, are you going to play that game? Are you going to play that game? But you see, it's it's showing us in this movie that it's hypothetical. And what's the solution? Well, again, if you use your memory and your prayers to focus on what you really want, mm. joy, happiness, love, and innocence, the, the world's just going to play out reflecting the desire of your heart. Mm. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Yeah. Like, you don't need to think that this will end in the world, or this will, person will be elected, or this party will take all these things, you don't need all these effects to be in a certain way for you to be happy, you just need to focus the power of your mind on the use of memory of what you want the most. And then you draw everything to you. 
And that's what I was sharing earlier today. That's why I've had a, a, a ball. I've had so much fun over these last 25 years since my first visit to LA because it was the prayer of my heart just to extend this happiness and joy and not to try to control the script. I didn't see myself getting invited to 44 countries. I didn't see myself having all these dear, loving friendships all over the world that, that were just reflecting the joy in my heart. It's like everything came so easily and it didn't cost anything. In fact, that was the most wonderful part. There's no cost to it. By focusing your mind and your use of memory in that way, everything gets given to you as gifts. And then there's more gifts, like Jesus has said, and more and more. It just keeps coming to you and coming to you. And that's what the value of forgiveness is. And that's what we need. We need to see that there's an important value there, instead of trying to use time and use memory to just keep recirculating guilt. Some of you remember the classic movie with Bill Murray, Groundhog Day, you know, where he gets, he's in this loop, and he tries killing himself over and over again, I might add, <laughs> unsuccessfully, and then he, he tries relationships, he's, he's got his eye on Rita, and he's going to use all of his past knowledge, and, and he's got more of a, a broader perspective, to try to seduce Rita to get her into bed. And, you know, he's using the kind of ice cream she likes, Rocky Road, you know, she, she's into world peace, you know, he knows all these personal values that she has, so he's using them for one outcome. And he starts to get really close, and then all of a sudden she starts slapping him. And she slaps him, and she slaps, she slaps the heck out of him. Because there's some point when you're playing the ego's game to try to use the ego to get something that you want individually. That's not forgiveness. You might remember the bar team tender in that scene, you know, where he was watching the, the game that he was using, everything, and he just was smiling and shaking his head like, Oh, but you're in for a rough landing. If, that's, <laughs> if you think that, and, and she, he gets so close to getting her into bed, and then slap, 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 slap. He can't. He gets so dejected. Then he goes into despair and tries to kill himself. The whole movie is showing what this movie is showing: that as long as we believe in hypotheticals, as long as we go go searching for this happiness and outcomes of the world, we're just looking in the wrong place. We need to go inside and find our happiness, our joy, our contentment, find our purpose, and then let that purpose just come radiating through us. Maybe we sing it, maybe we dance it, maybe we laugh and tell jokes, we hug. Who knows how it looks? Who cares? Actually, I always who cares how it looks? How it feels, how it feels is important to us. And he's going to go through that, because now, He's still excited about baseball, he's still trying to convince the light that there's something good. And you know, the light gave a pretty quick answer. You, know, you value your ignorance of what is to come. Oh no, it's so much more exciting, right? To go pay a fortune teller money to tell you what's going to happen in the future, instead of tapping into your own mind and starting to know what you already know. Like the, you know, the oracle in the Matrix. She, she gives Neil a little time, she looks at his hands, she looks, open your mouth, she's giving him time to recognize, she already showed him the sign, know thyself, and she's giving him as much time as he needs, and then he goes, I'm not the one. <laughs> and she just, the oracle can't give him what he, he has to know that for himself. Know thyself is not something you go to an oracle for. <laughs> you know, your identity. You may get a glimpse of what's going to happen in the future, but even that, it's how you use it. Even, some of us have got some interesting things told to us, but how do you use it? You see, it still comes back to the power of your own mind. Like you have all the answers already in there, but you won't know those answers as long as you keep focusing on the guilt, focusing on the attack, focusing on the, the shame, the grief. So here we go. He's, he's going to go through this now because his main issue is he's got this anger and this deep sense of loss around his wife and the light. I loved it how when he was there saying, you know, this 
this is one of the worst memories of this, this is where I lost my wife, and she comes through one in a pink bikini. Mate had almost lost it there, she's like, ah! Because <laughs> it was such a dark memory. This, this was just like, you know, like something stabbed me in my heart. It was just like, ah, oh, you know, I can't stand it, because I, was got, I got so cold, like I was freezing. Like yeah. that moment. Yeah, that moment. Because it was the contrast of the two. Like, here's the light using this white and a pink bikini to come through to say, you exist here. Mm -hmm. And what she's really saying is what? You exist everywhere. Mm -hmm. Why are you, do you keep breaking time into the good or the bad, the right, the wrong, when you exist everywhere? Mm -hmm. It's like he's trying to tell the light, I don't want to exist in bad memories, and I do want to exist in good memories. And the light's saying, you exist everywhere. You exist everywhere. That's the fact of it. That's the truth. You're, you're a holy child of God. You're not even bound by time and space. Your spirit could never be limited to a little body. You exist everywhere. So this is the beauty of this little movie because, yeah, it can be piercing when you see that because it's such a contrast to the ego's perceptions. Wasn't, wasn't, I felt like she, she was saying, you're stuck here. You're stuck right. in this yeah, I feel that too. That's a choice. But the thing about it is, is like what she told him before, like he said, it's the past. Jennifer's gone. She said, she is part of your existence. Yeah. You know, it, whether it's whatever, it's, he's trying to break it into past, present, future, which is why I set this whole thing up saying the ego has made up its own version of past, present, and future. And he's trying to, to limit his awareness to some aspect of these artificial constructs, and they're saying, no, it's beyond that. It's all about allowing. Yeah, it's all about allowing. So we're going to see him crack here. He's like a nut <laughs> that has got all that anger pent up, and he needs to crack. <laughs> he needs to pop. Okay, let's see him pop. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only realization you have to come to. Is that it's not linear. That, that the mind is choosing, and and the temptation is to project it into these things happen, you know, stories. This is my story, this is what happened to me. You know, the stories keep getting repeated over and over. The ego loves it when you just repeat these stories over and over and over to anybody you can talk to, because it's like the mind is trying to justify its state of mind, instead of accepting that it's a choice, that it is not linear at all. That all those so-called factors have nothing to do with anything. And that we can choose to be happy. We know it inside, we can feel it. Mm. We still have that memory in us that we can choose to be happy. You know, I remember in my life when I was reading uh, Viktor Frankl's books about uh, Nazi Germany. And that was, that just lit my heart up when I first read Viktor Frankl. I was like, oh my God, you mean we could be happy in the face of, of Nazi Germany. I thought, if you could be happy with that, you could choose happiness with anything. That's what they're teaching him. They're just teaching him. It is not linear. He had to crack because, you know, he kept trying to tell the stories. Linear appropriation. Every day shapes the next. No, it doesn't. Days don't shape days. We have a power of mind to choose our our attitude, and nothing can block us from having the kind of experience we want to have, except taking our false, our, our memories and focusing on, on attack, as if we've been mistreated, we were attacked, we were taken advantage of, you know, those are all the victim stories. And it's just focusing the mind on that belief in victimization, that's the misuse of memory. And we don't have to do that anymore. We, we have the power, we have the tools. Whatever pathway you choose, you know, the course was what I used to just really start to see that I had the power of choice. An angel has come. <laughs> the symbol of innocence. <laughs> he could go around. A see, this is what I'm talking about, guys. This is why I'm wagging my tail. <laughs> He's so full of happiness and energy. Oh.
Very funny. <laughs> so let's see the very end of this, because the very end of this is he's gonna, Cisco gets a chance to meet Picard again. And that's the blessing of forgiveness. That's the blessing. <laughs> That was it. So you can see the transfer value of that. That has enormous transfer value. It's just, you, you can see like, wow, I can, my whole experience of the world, my whole experience of life can just go in a, in a fresh, clean, clear direction. I don't have to feel burdened by the past, by whatever someone told me, but whatever I thought about myself, the memories, it's not even asking you to like redo the memories, it's more just asking you to hold the purpose in mind that you want, and let your mind just draw forth the reflections mm -hmm. of that fresh, new, clean, clear purpose. And it works, it, that's the best part of it, you just start to call more and more witnesses and evidence like, oh yeah, and you feel how worthy you are of love. That's the, that's the greatest thing. This belief that we're unworthy of love just gets acted out in so many different ways. And, and the mind can even be a little hesitant, like, oh, it's, it started out this way, <laughs> started out good a few times and then took a really bad turn. And then those memories are so strong it's just the ego use of the memories that the mind is shaky and afraid to to meet in the holy instant. To meet for the first time. What if, instead of dating with all kinds of future expectations, what if you really would go on a date to meet in like a holy encounter? Like Jesus calls it. You know, when you meet someone, remember it is a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. He says, never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. So imagine, every time you go out to get the, the guests in the car, every time you go to the grocery store, to do your laundry, to do shopping, to go on a date, I've had, I mean, to tell you in the last 25 years, I've had a lot of amazing dates. I've had group dates, <laughs> like we're having here. Yeah. I've had dinner dates, lunch dates, breakfast dates. <laughs> if they looked at my life, they would see that I'm just having a bunch of fun with a lot of encounters. Just letting the encounter come in a beautifully collaborative way, where there's just this acknowledging the, the presence and the love and the beauty that's already there. And it's a beautiful purpose for those encounters. And it's very convincing. You can imagine, just like in this world, if you practice something and you repeat it over and over and over, it just strengthens it in awareness. But you, you go into it with that glee, with that joy, with that openness. You don't even know what's going to happen. In fact, you're so happy that if nobody shows up, you have a great time, too. <laughs> because you don't even have an expectation that somebody's going to be there. You know, it, it's, it's not the, about them. It's not about them. It's not about bodies, it really. is when It's about just opportunities to extend this happiness and joy. And then, then your mind starts to waft up in the higher and higher states of consciousness where you notice that the old motives and the old programming is just absent. It's just not not there anymore. Things can seem to fall down all around you and you just burst out laughing. You, you just think, oh this is perfect, you know. And, and then you just laugh at so many things. People say, well you really have an interesting sense of humor, but, but it doesn't really matter what the outcome is. You know, you can't sometimes stop from laughing. And, and before, you know, when things would fall apart, the ego is just, oh it has such a an emotional fit, and things don't go a certain way, and then the contrast of that gentle laughter, you know, when things just start crashing apart, you know, that's, we've seen even in movies, you know, where people are having one of those days where, okay, what next, and then when it, the next thing comes, they just burst into laughter. 
because they, they just realize somewhere deep inside them that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like Grace Flex said, let the world around us just fall apart. Maybe we can make it if we're heart to heart. You know, that is a classic line. It's a classic line. Heart to heart. And you don't even need any more than that. <laughs> That's a very... Angel is like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we had the baby singing along with us, and now I, don't, I have to ask, is there an amen? Can I have an amen from the choir? <laughs> <laughs> she responded. She responded. She's responsive, very responsive. So. <laughs> what a vibe. <laughs> oh, precious. Ah, okay. Anybody have anything to share? Because we, you could come up to one of these chairs and I can pass the microphone if you have anything you'd like to share. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I don't think I need the microphone unless someone can't hear me, but um, you keep speaking about memory and the importance of remembering what we want to remember, but at what point is that like giving in to dissolution? or an illusion of what, I mean, if, if a person is very sweet and loving one moment, but then maybe the very opposite in another moment, <coughs> are we supposed to tell ourselves, oh, this person's an angel and so sweet and, you know, but, I mean, how do we, how do we see clearly, but still see through the eyes of the divine light and how Jesus would want us to see through and to see everyone? Yeah, that's a good question, because that's getting down to the, the practicalities of it, which I think are the most important, always. Ideas. These ideas, it all comes down to practicalities. Sometimes, I think a lot of us who come to Earth, we thought, you know, we have, a, we have owner's manuals for cars, for appliances, for watches, for phones, but we never got an owner's manual about that very question, because that would probably be one of the first things that you would want addressed in your owner's manual. Mm -hmm. What happens when a person seems loving and then they turn on you? They turn on you. It's like Jekyll and Hyde. They, whoa, you get the other side. And Jesus, in his Course in Miracles, when you, you work your way back through all these chapters, when you start to get towards the later chapters, he has a beautiful section called Rules for Decision. So basically, he lays it all out, and he says basically, he gives, he starts off with two. He says, now here's, it's kind of cool just to have two things to keep in mind every day to go through your whole day with. But his first one is, decide the kind of day that you want which is really good. That's why I'm focused, when I say focus, focus your mind, focus your use of memories on what kind of day you want. You could be specific, but I think it's, it's better if you focus on really the emotion you want. Do you want a loving day, a joyful day, a peaceful day, a happy day, a gleeful day? What? Focus on the kind of day that you want. And then comes number two. And he says, Say to yourself, if I make no exceptions, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. So you see how powerful it is. He's saying, decide the kind of day that you want. And if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that is to be given me. What does that mean, no decisions by myself? No decisions by my ego self. Don't, no decisions by my personal self. Because remember, the ego is a death wish. It, it will try to sabotage that happy, joyful, peaceful day. So you start to get an experiential sense that, that whatever you're perceiving, you are receiving. You are giving it and you're receiving it. Like you sent a messenger out from your mind and this character 
is acting out that message. Mm -hmm. And when we send out hurtful, angry, vicious messengers, they do what they're meant to do. They bring back witnesses. So, the reason that we need more than the first two, he doesn't stop there. He goes three, four, five, six, seven. He, he actually gives you procedures to do once you've gotten off of your first two. It's easier to have a happy day if you can just stay very devoted to the first two. I'd say it's the same with the Ten Commandments. It's easier to practice the Bible if you could practice the first two commandments. You don't need the rest. You don't need three, four, all the way up to ten. You do real well with number one and two. It's the same with this thing, with one and two. Now, where the other part comes in, when the mind seems to go off, is when it, it, it has an egoic self-concept goal. So, that's where preferences and beliefs come in. When, when the mind gets locked into the sen sense of like, oh, I know how my happy day is going to go. I get a call back from this, I get this happening, and so and so pays me the money that they said they'd pay me. And, oh, you go down there into those beliefs and expectations, and your chances of having a happy, peaceful, joyful day have just gone down the tube. With a, it's like that song, maybe it was The Temptations, but it was just my imagination running away with me, <laughs> running away with my identity, my very identity because of these beliefs, these agendas, these forced things that I was trying to get the characters to act out in a certain way. And when they don't play the part that the ego has assigned, mm, not happy at all. And then even worse, the ego might try to fight and manipulate and control to try to bring about the outcome that it wants. And it just gets more twisted yeah. and more distorted when we go through that. So, I was talking to Pecoria about that when you were saying about the trip to India. It was, and we were talking about this, I was saying, well, because he, he brought up the question, like, what did you do if you have thoughts about you know, the long travel, or the, could be anything, the luggage, accommodations, and logistics of traveling to India, but you kind of get bogged down into that. And I was saying, yeah, it's, I had to get to a point where what this movie was showing was so important to me that I finally decided to have kind of like what the Christians call like a born-again moment. But it's not the born-again of just professing the name of Jesus Christ, because it's not the words aren't going to do you anything. It's, it's one of those moments where you really say, okay, God, Spirit, Source, whatever you want to call, Presence, I'm really going to go for this. I am not going to try to manage my little personal life to try to get the outcome of happiness from my personal plans, my personal agendas, past learning, using all of our past learning. Because that's the trick. I mean, I was in university for 10 years, and why would anybody spend 10 years in university except the belief that you're learning something valuable that's going to make you happy later in life? And, and ultimately, I had to give that up, too. I had to say, okay, I give that over to, um, I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> you do, I don't. You shall lead, I shall follow. Um, there's even a, a workbook lesson in the course where it's like, I choose the second place to gain the first. Second, uh, I'm the follower here, I will follow. Remember Sister Act? Where are you be? I will follow you. You know, <laughs> they take all those great songs and they turn them into songs to God, and it's spectacular. They all fit very well. I have, a, I have a really good example of that. I went to Malaga in August to do the, the, the gathering with Jenny and Greg, and I just got guidance to go. And I, I don't try to do anything like that, but I got guidance from the Holy Spirit, and I booked my flight, and I went by myself, and I got to Malaga, and it was, it's, a big, it's a big city. 
and I got, I, not that many people spoke English, and I got on this bus, and I, they, you know, I shoved my luggage on this bus, and they said, uh, I was asking people, do you know where this hotel is? And, you know, people like, you know, they didn't speak English, so I'm, I'm, I'm guided the whole time. I'm going on complete guidance. This lady turns around, she looks at me, she goes, when do I tell you going to speaks perfect English? I go, I'm going to this hotel. She goes, I'm getting off there. I was spending one night there. She says, "Get grab your luggage and get off and go with me, and we'll get off." It's like, and that's it. Was like yeah. such a profound yeah. example. Yeah. And out of the midst of all this, here she was. She just turned around and looked at me, and I never. She took me in the hotel. I never saw her again. <laughs> that is a beautiful example because it's because that's really it's asking us to give up our our firm belief that our past learning has taught us enough for us to navigate and survive, which we really, it's, it's not going to go pretty if we keep trying to use the past to escape the past. Hmm, how is that? Only the Holy Spirit can use the past to escape the past. But the ego uses the past to keep the past, to make it seem like that's all there is. And that's part of everything in the perceptual world, Jesus tells us, is, is all past. He actually goes so far as to say, this world was over long ago. <laughs> like he's living in a state of ecstasy, pure bliss and happiness that he calls the kingdom of heaven. And he says, hey listen, it's over long ago. This thing's been answered, and why don't you come back with me into the projector room, uh, back into the light, and let's have a good laugh at the thing. It doesn't matter whether it's a horror movie, you want to watch Godzilla? Fine. King Kong? That's fine too. Poseidon Adventure, we'll have a good laugh. They're all funny when you are not caught up into the body as your identity. But as soon as we get identified with the body, then a dragon, Godzilla, you know, suddenly the scale of these monsters, you know, become pretty big. I was just watching on Facebook and it was this, this big man, but it was a massive grizzly bear. Some of you might have seen it, where they were just hugging each other and he was massaging, the thing looked like, it must have been like five, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred 600, 700, 800 pounds. And this was a big, big man, but I mean, this bear was massive. And he was just cuddling, the bear was like holding his mouth open and, and he was just cuddling. And then I flipped on another one and it was, it was a man with all these lions. He had raised them from cubs. Yeah, it was amazing. They just loved him and loved him. Big cats, very big cats. But it just shows how it's just the fear, it's the interpretation in the mind mm -hmm. that something's dangerous out there. And then the mind sets up all these defenses, yeah. you know, fences, protections, protectors, clothing, guns, Cecil the lion, you know, the, the shooting the lion and taking the skin, all this all the rage that came up all over the world, but that's that race that actually needs to come up. Mm. It's been so suppressed, it's so been pushed out of awareness, and, and that's the, everything's a forgiveness lesson. So oftentimes, I have people like work with the Course and mind training and kind of build their confidence and their momentum. Like you don't have to go diving in the deep end. If there's something that's traumatic, you don't have to force yourself into things. It was years ago, a friend of mine who channeled all this music from the angels, she, she just came to me and she just said, Oh, I, I have major issues with the Matrix when the first Matrix came out. And I just said, hmm, you really? And she said, yeah. She said, I, it's, I can't even, I couldn't stand to watch it. I just had to turn the, turn the movie off because it was so violent. And I said, well, why don't you just try journaling, like watch the whole movie with your journal and just write down all your thoughts and your feelings as you go through the movie. Let them up into awareness, but just put them down. And so she did. And then um, she said, I can't stand these Christian televangelists either. I just can't stand these preachers. I said, okay, watch the 700 Club, turn it on. <laughs> I said, journal all your thoughts and feelings with the Christian preachers too. And it got to the point where she did it, she did it, she practiced, she practiced. Because I always say that judgment in our mind, that's the violence. It's not a violent world. It's, 
he's judging the world is where the violence is because God's not, has nothing to do with any of that. She got to the point where she took me to an IMAX theater, which was like so many stories high, to see the Matrix with her. And we sat there and watched the whole Matrix with this giant theater, and she was so happy. And then the people around us were all like, oh my god, did you see this, this, and it's all these metaphysical, excited reflections that we drew. But she just took it in. She just allowed herself to feel the feelings, to let it all come up. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm very interested in this. I'm really, really, I'm, this is, I'm sort of very new at this. And I want to know if there's a conflict, because I'm a clairvoyant psychic and a hypnotherapist. That's what I do for a living. And it just sounds like they're not going to mesh. I'm just, what is your opinion? Well, clairvoyance and, and, and psych, psychic abilities and, and even hypnotherapy and everything, right. they all can be used. Like, I've seen everything that most people would consider a part of the New Age. I've seen the Spirit use it all so graciously. I've seen people that are like I traveled one time and the woman I was traveling with had a lot of repression. She went into the convent when she was 14 years old, a lot of repression. And we were traveling and I got a little uh, flyer that said, Course in Miracles Hypnotist. <laughs> and we went there and this man took her down into hypnosis and she had all these repressed emotions that came up for healing. The same with with clairvoyance and the, and the same with um, even psychic abilities, that there's nothing right or wrong about the abilities, but it's it's what use do you put them? Because the ego will try to hijack uh, the psychic abilities. I always think of the like the Dion Warwick hotline and this and that. If, I mean, if any if the ego tries to use it for its goals, fame, fortune, recognition, so on and so forth. Oftentimes, the, the psychic abilities will even leave. You'll lose them when they're so misused by the ego, you know, in the wrong direction. And yet, um, Jesus used a lot of those same kind of things with the scribe of A Course in Miracles. Jesus was always talking to them about past lives, and at one point, I think the scribe had killed her collaborator in a past life, but he just was using them to show them a progression and there was healing occurring. Okay. So, so yeah, there's no conflict okay. in that at all. Yeah. It's all a good setup for innocence. Innocence, innocence. We're ringing the bell. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to get a, a little bit more clarity on question that Lindsay was asking about so if someone's really nice and then they turn on you, were you ref and then you talked about like perceiving the violence as outside of yourself I don't know, I just didn't feel like her because that's a question yeah. for me as yeah, well there's, so more. Like, there's yeah. more to that the, the basically the Holy Spirit in our mind only perceives two orders of thought love and a call for love mm -hmm. so when we drift out of those two orders of thought then then we get into very defensive um, interpretations, very fearful interpretations. So the way I say it is, the Holy Spirit sees love, or a call for love, the ego sees attack. So when we say, like Lindsay was saying, well what if the person turns on you and everything, as soon as we perceive attack, then we've already bought the bait. In other words, we've, we've taken a bite out of the ego's bait. And it's, it's a dark road, you know, it gets very defensive, it gets into attack and defense and all kinds of twisted things. So, the Holy Spirit is there to convince us that attack is impossible. And that takes practice. It, like, I call it mind training, like, I, I never try to, you know, paint, you know, a rosy picture of, that overlooks the mind training. I see that I, 25 years ago, when the Course came into my life, right out here in Southern California, just dropped into my lap, then I, I thought, oh my God, I've got no excuses now. This is as plain as day. 
I mean, I, I couldn't have it explained to me any clearer than this. Now it's on me. I can't, you know, say, oh, you, you didn't give me enough help, and you know, <laughs> that's why I'm at the pearly gates and not in there, because you, where were you? You know, and Jesus is like, oh, it's actually there <laughs> every step of the way. So, as soon as I kind of really felt it, then I thought, oh, I'm a practical application, I'm just going to mm. apply this. What it did was, it, it opened me up to miracles of going from shy and closed down to being used in very helpful ways for my brothers, my sisters, obviously for myself. But practicing, 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 so much so, that one time, uh, years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine, and um, she said, oh, come on, we'll watch movies, and have popcorn, and have a good time. So I went to visit her, and we were, I was spending some time with her watching movies, and she didn't tell me that she was divorced a couple years before, and she had an insanely jealous uh, husband, who basically was kind of, you know, just acting out in all kinds of ways. And so, I basically, oh, he comes in. Oh, he says, we interrupt this terrible for this playtime. <laughs> so, anyway, there was one time um, where I was on the floor, and she was back on the couch. We were watching one of these metaphysical movies, and I think I was, I was kind of on my side, and I was playing with my hand like this, and watching the movie, and then this guy shows up, and it's like a Jack again, it's like, Jack Nicholson movie, you know, it's like this, his face with these kind of beady eyes, yeah. red face, and he's even kind of got some saliva <laughs> coming out, I think. And so, I'm, I'm really focused, I'm just, I'm in purpose, you know, I'm watching the movie, and you know, at this point I've just given, I just feel so happy and relaxed and secure in Christ for everything. So, there's this pounding and banging, and, and in the door he comes, and I'm just on the, on the carpet watching the movie. She's like, so I'm just kind of there watching, and then he's he's kind of he's some saliva coming out, and his face is red, and it's just it's one of these characters like Lindsay was having. It's a raging <coughs> exception. Although I don't know any of this, you know, I'm just clueless. I'm invited to watch the movie and eat some popcorn, you know. So, so I'm there and I'm watching, and he comes in and he just comes over and he's standing over me, and then he he reaches down and he grabs my shirt and he starts to pull on my shirt, and I'm still in the same position. Uh, I'm just watching the movie as if as if nothing at all is happening. Actually, because that's actually my experience, you know, I'm kind of like watching the world, so I'm enjoying the miracle and everything, and then this character said, I'm in the miracle. So, it was a sweater. It was a sweater. You were looking at the sweater, you were just more intrigued with the Yes, knit. The, it was a sweater, and it was being stretched. Yeah. And I was just like, I was still was, I was like looking at the sweater stretched, and I still wasn't moving, I was still in my reclined position. You know how Jesus is supposed to be me. I was being meek. I was really meek. I wasn't a, didn't put a hand up, nothing. So it's this, and then, then my, you know, my friend comes shooting off of the couch. She's like, does this power aerobics stuff, and she's like an aerobic trainer. She comes shooting off of the couch like a missile, and blasts into this guy. I'm still down there in my same position. She blasts into him and knocks him across the living room, knocks him across the kitchen, and blasts him out the door. I think that I was even some blood that was flying. I mean, she hit him. The NFL, National Football League, they were pets. You, she had adrenaline. And, and, and I just was still watching. The sweater was a little stretched. I noticed. But, you know, that's just the way it went. And then, and, and I mean, that was that episode. But, but I, that's the teachings of the Course. The work for lesson is in my defenselessness, my safety lies. In my defenselessness. That's what he was talking about. To, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That was one of his teachings from the Sermon on the Mount. And when we really go into that, it's interesting that the best defense is no defense. 
when we're peaceful, when we're still, when we're relaxed, of course, we're invulnerable, because we're aligned with Source. And what could be greater than be aligned with Source? That's in the Bible too. When, if God is with me, who can be against me? It says in the Bible. So, so really, it's, it's very practical. But I've, I've had to practice many, many times. I've even had that where like a, an animal will come charging at me, growling and everything, and I never know what the spirits can do. Sometimes they fall down to my knees on the ground and throw my arms open, and the dog or whatever just kind of stops, like, cause, because it's just love, you know? That's back in the days. Now, it's, these are the kind of witnesses that get out. You know? <laughs> we don't get growling dogs. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. <laughs> So when Nikita comes, she has the same thing going on in the canvas with the cat. See, the cat loves her, her socks. Now, they look like little little animals, too. It's got little eyes and little nose and ears, and it's a perfect play toy. But, yeah, so it's just, if you keep working it, you keep working it, you see, wow, my mind is so powerful, I really need to be free of these attack thoughts. Because if I hold on to anything, then you know it's, it will be reflected. That's crazy. That's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. And it works with symptoms as well. If you, you just start to develop some kind of symptoms in the body, that's no different than seemingly an attacker or whatever. It's the same thing. That if there's dis-ease in the mind, if the mind is, is not in harmony, then it just draws forth witnesses. And then at some point you say, hmm, I don't want to do this anymore. don't want to play those games. In myself, it's a cry for help. I mean, yeah. if I would see someone angry, and, and if it's not love, it's a cry for love. Or, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned too in that parable, a little bit later on, I was taking a walk for a, to do a meditation in a pine forest or something, and this car screeched to a halt, and this guy jumped out, and he came out, and he grabbed the body of David, and threw the body down, and um, the body, the head seemed to hit like a, a metal post or something. I, I didn't feel anything, I didn't feel any fear or anything like this. Then as soon as that happened, then another car was driving around, and this lady came up and she rolled her window down and she says, what's going on here? Is, is everything okay? And he was like, everything's fine, everything's great. And then he, he turned from attacker into Mother Teresa. <laughs> he was like scooping the, scooping the body up, and, and then we went, um, yeah. and he had heard something from his ex-wife about I guess what I do, and, and he was he was trying to bring in methylate and pain pills and everything, and he's spilling them all over the place. And he goes, "I know you don't even believe at this, but it was very conflicted." And and then his his heart cracked open because he it was a call for love, and he had all this sadness and hurt about losing his wife and his perception and and the family. You know, the same kind of hurt that everybody is, is healing. And we ended up just sitting and talking for quite a while. It was just, he had never gone to a psychologist, a counselor, he, he had just stuffed all this hurt down. And this was just a backdrop for him to heal, to crack open. And it turned into a beautiful, holy encounter. And that's the beauty of it, how there's always a purpose behind it. Even Peace Program always felt whenever she was walking around, she would be meet somebody at a bus stop or something here that, that she was always being used in a very purposeful way, you know, for healing. Mm -hmm. It's 5.45. It is. Time flies when you're having fun. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you all. What a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.